Welcome to part two, Nut and Fancy at Headquarters Central, my primary reviewing table, talking about the Nikon Monarch binos, i.e. binoculars. They're my number one high value reference set of binoculars, and I've talked about them in part one. We left off talking about phase correction of the prisms, and this gets to the coatings. Look for that. You want binoculars that are phase corrected. You will spend more to get them. I'll tell you that now. However, you're going to have big dividends in color fidelity, the image quality, the contrast, overall sharpness of what you're viewing. Phase correction is the only way to go. Now, and that gets, uh, that kind of goes along on my talking points with the coatings. Coatings are, in my understanding, and again, I'm not the end all expert, but they're expensive to do right. As uh, of course, the grinding of the glass and very high quality glass that goes into the binocular. Now, a lot of what I've read and studied years ago when I was really researching binoculars hard so I could get my own, that's how I, I'll tell you how I arrived at the Monarchs later, but everything I read said, hey, look for back four prism glass, that that is the best, the highest quality, and by back four, I mean BAK-4. In my experience, that is not the case. Generally, any get this is talking about the glass quality here. Any binocular that touts that it has back four prisms is going to be a low optical quality binocular. Let's go to the Cabela's catalog and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Cabela's, by the way, is one of my reference standards of where to go get optics. That's because you can buy them and you can try them, and if they don't work for you, you can send them back. And yeah, you're going to pay more at Cabela's, but let me tell you, it's going to be worth it because you're going to be able to test drive them. And there's not a lot of places that will allow you to do that. Please, if you try, if you do do this, treat them well. They should be absolutely brand new if you decide to return them. If you don't do that, it's just jacking up the next dude. It's not honest. So yeah, try them, but treat them very, very carefully. They should look brand new if you decide to, decide to do that. But yeah, I'll tell you more about Cabela's later. But here's two proprietary Cabela's brands. Again, when I'm making this video, it's November 2008. These are all subject to change. Right now, they have an Alpha series. Don't know who makes them. When you guys might. Don't really care. But here we go. Look, phase corrected. Phase correction coatings. Hmm, there's your code word for high quality. Huh, how does that compare against the Nikon Monarchs? Well, the field of view, I'll talk about that in a second. There's your height. Uh, weight, 30 ounces? Dude, they're cheaper, but they're full on 9 ounces heavier than a Monarch. Again, back to the size and weight issue, Monarchs are pretty much the class leader. But I was talking about back four. Hmm, there's it is right there. Back four. Roof prisms. When you guys look at gear, I don't care what it is. Scopes, guns, knives, whatever. Often, not always, but often price is a very good representation of quality. So if we look at these supposedly super quality back four roof prism, Pine Ridge roof binoculars, I'll tell you now, they're going to be uh, adequate, but they're going to suck. You know, some users would use them and go, you know what, I love these. Nut and Fancy does not like the Pine Ridge. I've already tried them. They suck. Uh, all back four prism models suck. Uh, they they just don't have the clarity. Your eyes are going to hurt after looking through them for a while. But again, let me get back. Where's my pointer? Mm, I'm going to use my Delica. Okay, if we go right here, let's look. 10 by 42, that's my reference standard, 189. We just saw 229 up here. So if back four prisms are so super quality, how come they're not more? Well, the reason is because is they're not. And any super high quality binocular will never brag that it has back four prisms. Let's go look at some Zeiss. Here's a, the Zeiss page. Do we see anything there that says back four? Nothing. Oh, we see something there. What's that? Phase correction on the prism coatings. Again, that's your code word for quality. So forget back four. That's a Walmart terminology. And if you decide that that's really important to you, you're going to get a Walmart uh, pair of binoculars. Um, so, price is a good overall indication of the quality of glass and coatings, but I do say that for th about $300, you can get a very high quality pair of binoculars that probably 99.9% .9 of users will be happy with. Now, if you are 
I don't know, an optics dude, and that is what drives you in life, and that's all you care about, then maybe it's not enough. Maybe you need to pull the trigger on some Svarskis. Huh, kind of like these ones, running around the $2,000 range. They're excellent, by the way. I love Svarskis. They're awesome. But, dude, I don't have money for that. Nor will most viewers watching this video. How about resolution and alignment? Well, I told you I was going to jump ahead in the talking points, and I did just that, talking about the phase correction. That gets to me towards a point of resolution, and with phase correction, of course, it's higher resolution. Now, along with that goes a little thing, and this is just me talking here, called alignment. You absolutely positively have to buy a pair of binoculars that aligns the left side with the right side. There can be no wiggle or no chance over time for those two barrels to become misaligned. If that happens, you introduce eye strain, in my opinion, and from some other binos I've had. You have to have a very rock-solid pivot on your binoculars that keeps those glasses through rough and tumble use, whether you're hunting, whether you're a soldier, a police officer, that keeps them in alignment all the time. It's easier, in my opinion, to do this with a roof prism as opposed to the poor prism design, but you have to have a very well aligned set of glass uh, glasses in order to prevent those problems. Enough said about that, but the, and you might say, well, dude, how do I know? Well, again, price is a good indicator. Anything along the $50 price is probably going to have alignment problems. And I'm not just talking about the pivot screw. I'm talking about how they set up the internal glass as well. Did they set it precisely within each barrel? Are the optics precisely aligned? I really don't know what to tell you other than you're going to find out real quick if they're aligned if you start spending a lot of times with your a lot of time looking through your glass. If you're a hunter, again, if you're a bird watcher, um, and you spend or watching whales, which I've done in Hawaii, hour after hour through your binoculars, and it's not enjoyable, I would submit to you that you do not have aligned optics. Um, there's probably more information out there on that exact subject on the web if you want to look it up. That's just a little heads up for me. Enough said on that. Versatility, next talking point. Okay, remember I said up here we got to make some compromises with size and weight. That is a fact of life. Versatility, what I'm going to say first off is magnification. Dude, what's the best magnification to have? And while I re address that, I'll talk about field of view, eye relief, exit pupil, pupillary distance. For me, the best all-around binocular magnification, that's where I'm going to start, is 10 power. But that's for what I do. Now, if you're on a boat and you have a lot of motion, 10 power may not be the best for you. Because the higher magnif magnification you go, the harder it is to hold your binoculars still and get a good image out of it. That's why you have image stabilized binoculars that try to combat that problem. Okay, so for me though, anything less than 10 power is, I'm kind of losing the detail that I want. Um, when I look through my binocular, I want to be able to see detail. That's the whole reason I have them. Now granted, I have to do some trade-offs. I can't have a binocular, um, you know, well, you're saying, well, if you want to see detail, go with a 16 power. Well, there's a limitation to what we're able to do. And this is where we're going to talk about exit pupil. Exit pupil means how much light is transmitted to your eyeball through the optics of the binocular. And the way you find that out is you'll take the size of your objective, which in this case is 42 millimeters, in other words my objective is 42 millimeters across, and divide it by the power. These ones are 10 power. So that gives me an exit pupil of 4.2 millimeters. Now what does that mean? Well the human eye has an exit pupil of anywhere varying between, I don't know, uh, 3 to 7 millimeters generally around 5 millimeters, depending on where your iris is and how much light it's letting in. But most, um, most binoculars, if they're properly made, will beat the exit pupil of your eyeball. Okay, uh, And then as it gets darker, 
you might want more because then our, our pupil opens up and we're able to absorb more light and therefore you'd want a binocular that can give you that light. And this gets to the exit pupil. Now hang with me if you're getting confused, don't. What we're saying is the more of a magnification you go and you do not change the, the enlargement of your objective, in other words, let's say I want to stay with a 42 millimeter objective, this size right here, and I say, you know what, I love detail. I want a 20 power binocular. Well, you just re reduce the amount of light coming to you. And so, and you can see this in a lot of different optical devices. You don't get anything for free. So, let's say, let's run that theoretically. What's our exit pupil on a 20 power, 42 millimeter objective? So, 42, that's our objective size, divided by, what did I say, 20? equals 2.1. That's not a light, and that is not a lot of light getting transmitted. Generally, you'd only be able to use those binoculars in the daytime and effectively under full brightness of sun. So as we increase our binocular magnification, if we want to keep that exit pupil serviceable, i.e. effective, we have got to increase our objective diameter, generally speaking. Now, when you get into higher end binoculars like Leica's, Swarovski's, you know, Zeiss even, and some other European brands, even some Japanese brands, there are ways around this and you actually get more um, exit pupil than maybe the math would show. And I think the Monarchs are that way too. On paper, the exit pupil of 4.2, which these binos have in 10 power, should not be that impressive. However, under low light conditions, I find they work very well indeed. Now the A power, what's that going to do with our exit pupil? Bueller? Anyone? It's going to increase it, right? Because if we run that math, and I won't do it so you don't get bored, it's going to equal a 5.25 exit pupil, if I remember right. In other words, there's going to be more light getting transmitted to our eye through the eyepiece because we've reduced our magnification and that increases the light transmission. The exit pupil is larger. The way we can see the exit pupil actually just by looking through I think this one. There's your exit pupil. How much light is getting true. Now that's a G whiz. It doesn't matter for crap. But there's no free lunch. So what's the best magnification? Again I'm going to say the 10 power. Because the exit pupil with a very high quality set of binos like these ones of 4.2 uh, the exit pupil it works for me. It works in the daytime, it works at dusk, and I've proven these to work pretty much at nighttime as well. Why do I have eight powers? Because sometimes I'm on a moving vehicle. I'm on in a situation where I need a wider field of view, getting to that talking point. And what does that mean? It just basically means, and I'm not going to bore you with the math, how much can we see at a thousand yards? A wide field of view would mean that we can see people standing apart a certain distance at a thousand yards. Let's go back to the Cabela's catalog, a great re reference again. And field of view is FOV, it's almost always shown as a specification. Let's go to a 10 by 42 and the field of view on these SLC roof prisms is 330 feet at a thousand yards. Now you can compare that against the Nikon Monarchs, which I gotta find them wherever they are against light models. Here's the, here's the Monarchs. What's the field of view on them? Well, there's his camo. Not quite as good. 314 feet at 1,000 yards. But guess what? 319 versus, uh, what, an $1,800? Not bad. And for most users, most people will not care about that number because it's so close. The field of view, if I'm not mistaken, is highly dictated by the design of the eyepiece and also the optics inside. So there's different things that perhaps Farsky did to get that bigger field of view in their glass. Um, but for me, anything above 300 feet at 1,000 thousand yards will work for me. How about eye relief? How is that important? Well, eye relief means how far or how, how close do you have to be to your, your eyepiece in order to see the image. This is where fold down or rotatable eye cups come into play. If you're an eyeglass wearer, you need this feature. What does that mean? I can change that distance, the eye relief distance, by extendable cups like I am doing now. See, I rotate that out, bam. 
that's actually without eyeglasses. That's how most people wearing contacts without eyeglasses would look through the binocular. If you do have glasses, then you would rotate them down. And your glasses would provide you that eye relief that you need. And they work pretty darn good. There's also other versions of binoculars, kind of like these sports stars I showed you earlier, that have fold-down cups. It serves the same purpose, but if we're wearing eyeglasses, we would fold the cup down like that and jam it right against our big ol' uh, you know, glasses so we can see. It's not just eyeglasses, though, and you guys need to consider this. It's for sunglass wearing, too, which is pretty much everybody. So everybody will have a need to look through the glasses just like they're shown here with the eye cups in the down position. I won't get into the distances of eye relief. I find the Monarchs are ideal for, for me. Well, I shouldn't say ideal. When they're folded down, I can't remember if they're too close, a little bit too far away for the sunglasses I wear, but you know what? It works, and at least you're able to do that. So eye relief is not a super critical thing to think about, but at least have a variation of eye cups. All quality binoculars these days, in my opinion, pretty much have that. How, what's pupillary distance mean? That just means how big your old eyeballs set in your head. And your binocular needs to be able to match them. It needs to be able to extend very narrow and very wide. And I think the limitation with some people might be these monarchs, maybe they don't go wide enough for your big old eyeballs set in your head. You need to check them out in the store or buy them from Cabela's and test them. If they don't work, you can send them back. But that's interpupillary distance, you know, and they have to match your eyeballs, uh, how far apart they are. Because that's a very critical distance, in my opinion. To get the binoculars to work the way they're designed to work, you absolutely have to do that. Uh, along with versatility, you have individually focusable eyepieces. Well, not individually. On the Monarchs, it's just the right side, which is standard with most binoculars. In other words... There's a whole procedure on how you're going to focus the binoculars for your individual eyes. I won't go into that, but most every pair that I see that's halfway quality has that feature. That's end of part two, by the way. Whew, time flies when we're talking about a lot of fun stuff. This is my review on binoculars, medium-sized binoculars, with a Nikon Monarch being my reference set. Tune into part three. I'll hopefully wrap it up in part three. No promises. Nothing fancy.